Bring in show music, please. This is Squawk Pod from CNBC. I'm producer Cameron Costa, and here's what we're talking about today. South Carolina defeats Iowa for the NCAA title. WNBA Commissioner Kathy Engelbert on the big win for the team and for women's basketball. You need three things in sports. Household names, rivalries, and games of consequence, and March Madness had all of that. And where are you watching the eclipse? Former astronaut Mike Massimino will be in Arkansas, and he has some tips for viewing straight from NASA. Even if it's not united in the path of totality, it's still a really cool thing to see if it's even just partial. Those conversations and Nai Nai Yellen, our U.S. Treasury Secretary, is in China, and they're loving it. Plus, Elon Musk is feuding with Brazil over censorship on X. In Brazil, where I imagine there's a lot less business to be had, unfortunately, he's taking a very principled stand. It's Monday, April 8th, 2024, and Squawk Pod begins right now. Stand back you by in three, two, one, cue it, please. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Squawk Box right here on CNBC. We are live from the NASDAQ market site in Times Square. I'm Becky Quick, along with Andrew Ross Sorkin. Joe is out today. It's Monday morning, and uh, here we go. We've got a big week this week. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen winding down her visit to China after a busy weekend with leaders there. And Sarah Eisen is on the ground this morning from Beijing. She sat down with the secretary just a short time ago for a big exclusive interview. And we want to hear all about what happened, Sarah. It's good to see you, Andrew. And yes, from Beijing, where Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is wrapping up four full days in China. She spent the first part of the trip in Guangzhou down in the south in the advanced manufacturing hub and then the weekend and Monday here in Beijing where she met with government officials. The highest ranking official she met with was Premier Li, the number two leader in China. She met with local officials, including the mayor of Beijing, met with students at Peking University, economic students, and she received a very warm welcome and a lot of respect, I have to tell you, because of her economics background, despite issuing two pretty tough messages to these Chinese leaders. Number one was on this overcapacity concern that the U.S. increasingly has, that China is flooding the world with cheap exports of EVs and solar panels that they're subsidizing. She was harsh on that one and also on a matter of national security, where she warned China and other countries that there will be consequences if they fuel Russia's war machine. So I asked her if we are looking at sanctions for China coming. Here's what she said. It's not only Chinese companies. We would feel that any, particularly any financial institution that facilitated um, trade in dual-use goods or strictly military goods in violation of our sanctions and aiding Russia's military, um, we would consider sanctioning. The president issued a recent executive order that would enable Treasury to impose sanctions on financial institutions that are found to be doing this in a systematic way. And we've not used this tool yet, but it is one that would be available. And what I've tried to make clear is that um, we stand ready to act if we see significant violations by especially by financial institutions. Um, in China? That, well, and other countries as well. And I have to say, you know, I, she's front page news today and, and every single day this weekend. It's a huge deal over here. The, the coverage has been mostly friendly about the interactions, clearing, key economic issues being discussed as Yellen visit continues. Um, she's generally well liked. And part of it, I think, Andrew, is that she made a lot of time for some important cultural visits while she was here. She had a tour, a private tour last night of the Forbidden City, a very popular tourist destination here uh, right near Tiananmen Square. She right now, actually just a few moments ago, wrapped up a visit to a local brewery that actually imports American hops as an example of U.S. exports to China. And she's all over social media. Her nickname here is Yelun Nainai, which means Grandma Yellen. That's the extent of my Mandarin. But a sort of term of endearment in what is an increasingly tense U.S.-China 
relationship. She's really tried to keep the economics here separate than I think the more confrontational national security concerns. Sarah, thank you very much. Excellent job with all of this coverage. Jamie Dimon's JP Morgan uh, is uh, publishing his annual letter to shareholders. And we want to bring you uh, some of the news that's in this letter, uh, a highly watched letter annually. Uh, Diamond writes the following. He says that despite the, quote, unsettling landscape, war in the Middle East uh, and Ukraine, uh, growing geopolitical tensions in China and polarized electorate here in the U.S., that the U.S. economy, he thinks, uh, continues to be resilient with consumers still spending. He says the market seems to be pricing in a 70 to 80 percent chance of a soft landing. But Diamond thinks the odds are, quote, a lot lower. He cites persistent inflationary pressures, including what he says are, quote, ongoing fiscal spending, remilitarization of the world, restructuring of global trade and capital uh, needs of the new green economy. Another major theme in the letter is artificial intelligence. Diamond writing uh, that the consequences will be extraordinary. He says J.P. Morgan Chase has grown uh, its AI organization, quote, materially with more than 2,000 uh, machine learning experts or data scientists now on the payroll. Diamond also issuing a warning Quote, we may be entering one of the most treacherous geopolitical eras since World War II. He said he's also concerned about the large deficit supported by quantitative easing. I will say on, on the World War II piece, he says, when terrible events uh, happen, we tend to overstate uh, or overestimate the effects that they will have on the global economy. Recent events, however, may very well be creating risks that could eclipse anything hmm. since World War II, we should not take them lightly. I mean, that's, um, that's the risk manager side of him, right. but, but it, it's interesting. Jamie Dimon, I think, is somebody who's always been fairly optimistic about the United States and the economy. His concern about some of these geopolitical uh, uh, events is one that is echoed by other people who are generally pretty optimistic about things, right. if you talk to a Warren Buffett or someone, too. The letter generally, I should say, is what I would describe as cautiously optimistic. Yeah, yeah I think tonally, we, we, we've just hit on what I would describe as the news pieces in the letter. Right. Um, but I think tonally, it's, it's, it's an upbeat letter. He's talking about AI, uh, spends a bit of time. This is uh, 20 years now, 20-year uh, anniversary, uh, since the bank won J.P. Morgan Chase uh, deal, which actually put him in charge of the company, talks really about the growth of the bank. It's now the largest bank by market cap in the country. Uh, goes through a whole number of other uh, pieces to it, management lessons and other things. It is a worthy read, uh, by the way. There's only, there's only a few CEOs who actually really write their own letters without worrying about lawyers and lots of other people going through yep. and reading it and telling them what they can say, what they can't, actually writing it for them in a lot of cases. I mean, Jamie Dimon, obviously a huge one, Warren Buffett, Jeff Bezos always wrote a very um, straightforward letter from that you could yep. tell was written by him with their voices. I think Larry Fink's letter this year was mm -hmm. up there with that, where he wrote about yep. his parents uh, at the very top of the entire letter. Um, that's why these letters are so interesting. And I think the tone and the, his tone on the markets is one that he's been kind of consistent about over the last year or so, and that is the concern about a soft landing not necessarily being as certain as the market expectations seem to be and concern about higher inflation. In Brazil yesterday, a Supreme Court judge uh, opened an inquiry into Elon Musk this after the owner of X said that he would reactivate accounts on the platform that the judge had ordered blocked. Now, Musk said he would lift all the judge's restrictions because they were unconstitutional and called on the judge to resign. Neither side disclosed the specific accounts that were ordered blocked. Now, Brazil has been investigating digital militias that have been accused of spreading fake news and hate messages. In a post on X, is what Musk had to say. He said, quote, this judge has applied massive fines, threatened to arrest our employees, and cut uh, our access, uh, uh, cut access to X in Brazil. As a result, we will probably lose all revenue in Brazil and have to shut our offices there. But principles matter more than profit. Musk also vowed that X would publish all the judge's demands. Now, I just want to say one of the things that's very interesting about this, and I applaud him for doing this. However, you know, there have been times where he has said, we will follow the local law. Whatever the local laws, we will do. So in America, we will fight for, for uh, free speech. But in other countries, we may not fight for free speech. And this question has come up time and again. I've asked it to him uh, directly about China. 
which is to say, you know, if there are bad things happening in China, will you do something about it? And the answer is, we will follow the local law. Now, he has business, a lot of business in China. In China, I was going to say, um, Tesla. When it comes to <laughs> Tesla and other things. So if a judge in China were to say, hey, uh, we don't like what you're doing, it seems to me that you would hear him say, we will follow the local law. In Brazil, where I imagine there's a lot less business to be had, unfortunately, uh, he's taking a very principled stand. There you go. That's all. I, nothing else needs to be said. And um, no, it's... It's just probably right. the way yeah. of the world. Um, in other Musk news, uh, the Tesla CEO is saying the company will reveal its robo-taxi product. It's going to happen on uh, August 8th. Uh, Musk posted on X about the reveal date after Reuters reported earlier uh, that Tesla had scrapped plans for a highly anticipated low-cost electric car. Musk accused Reuters of lying without specifying any incorrect detail of their story. By the way, one thing on the judge, though, it is true that if you look at what this judge did, it, it's, it's just demonstrably a problem. And you could argue that maybe if there was a case in a country where he believes the laws, that the laws are in place to allow him to keep these people on the platform, that, and that the judge is making the wrong decision. So maybe, you know, I could go back and forth on this a little bit. Uh, meantime, on the artificial intelligence front, we're still in uh, Elon Musk land here. The Wall Street Journal reporting that uh, investors uh, close to Musk are in talks to help XAI raise $3 billion in a round that would value Musk's AI startup at $18 billion. Among the backers cited in the report, the VC firm Gigafund and Steve Jurvetson, who is a board member of SpaceX. Musk has uh, denied previously now many times the reports about raising additional money for XAI. So take it for what it is. And by the way, uh, we're going to be speaking with Ron Barron, a longtime Elon yep. Musk backer and Tesla shareholder. He's going to be joining us on Thursday, coming up a little this week, later this week. So we will talk about all of these issues um, with him at that point, too. Good time to check in with him. A follow up to a story we told you about last week. Snapchat is adjusting a ranking feature for paid subscribers that shows just how close you are to your Snapchat friends by displaying your position in what they call their solar system. This feature that basically says, are you Mercury? Because you're the person who's chatting back and forth and messaging back and forth with the most with this person? Or are you Uranus? Because you're the planet that is out in the uh, coldest regions of the solar system. You're not that actively engaged with them. It's a feature that was criticized after a Wall Street Journal piece reported on the impact on teens' anxiety. In response to the backlash, Snapchat will turn the solar system feature off by default, and users will then have to opt into it if they choose to use it. And Before this, it was the default that actually kicked in. I don't think this is a huge response. I think this is a way to say you're doing something without really doing something, because again, it's a popularity feature that makes all these kids feel bad about themselves. We have seen the research on teens and the depression levels, a lot of that tied back to social media. If you actually want to do something about it, you should change it so you're not ranking and making them. Look, let's face it, this is a, a oh, feature. So you're not, I thought you were gonna praise them for this. No, you turned off the default and made it so it's not the default, but you've already got everybody keyed into it so that yeah, we're already using this and we're gonna do it anyway. And tell me that this is not a way to try and get kids to use the app more frequently. Because oh, if, you are, if you get to rank the... higher based on how how often you're snapping back and forth with them. You know, it, it's like the complete gamification. It's the way to try and make sure that you are keeping these kids using this app more and more frequently, which, they, of course, they want to do as a business. But you're doing it at the expense of these teens' health. So it's a lousy. Oh, all these popularity okay. features are pretty lousy features, and you're jerks for doing it still. Wow. Okay. I mean, this is a way to say you're doing something without actually doing it. Okay, well, it's not the default, but we've already actually addicted them all to it and got them onto it. You're telling me any of those kids that you didn't introduce this to, aren't going to go in and flip the switch because, oh, we're already using this? Oh, I will bet good money the majority of users do not use do Because it's not the default, won't, won't be able to use it because it won't do it. I don't know. I, I, One I man's it. view. I doubt it. Up next on Squawk Pod, South Carolina winning the NCAA title, defeating Caitlin Clark and the Iowa team for the national championship. Commissioner of the WNBA, Kathy Engelbert, celebrates the win, the viewership records, and explains her strategy to build on momentum for women's sports. This is a long-term uh, sustainable economic model we're trying to build to fund things like charter and higher player pay, and we're well on our way. Big Four CEO turned WNBA Commissioner Kathy Engelbert right after this break.
Welcome back to Squawk Pod with Andrew Ross Sorkin and Becky Quick. Here's Becky. South Carolina became the 10th undefeated champion in women's college basketball history, defeating the Caitlin Clark-led Iowa team. Joining us right now to talk March Madness, the Caitlin Clark effect, and more, we want to bring in the WNBA commissioner, Kathy Engelbert. She is a former Deloitte CEO and now serves as a board member at McDonald's and Royalty Pharma. And Kathy, thanks for being with us this morning. I mean, uh, the viewership around what's been happening with the NCAA, but also with the WNBA has been pretty phenomenal. Um, Last night, Don Staley, the South Carolina coach, had this to say about Caitlin Clark, whose team she had just defeated. I want to personally thank Caitlin Clark for lifting up our sport. She's carried a heavy load for our sport, and it's not going to stop here on the collegiate tour. When she's the number one pick in the WNBA draft, she's going to lift that league as well. Do you agree with that uh, sentiment? Well, our draft, uh, Becky, is a week from today, and I do agree with the sentiment. It's really the confluence of a lot of positive things coming together on the business side, on the basketball side, and it's the rise of women's sport. It's Caitlin and others, Angel Reese, that big rivalry coming out of last year's national championship. So this generational talent, they have big followings on social media, increased media attention with uh, ESPN and ABC and our asset values are going up. And, you know, we raised that capital about a year and a half ago. Uh, first women's sports property raised 75 million in capital. So really just this confluence of all of this coming together and and Caitlin and Paige Beckers on Friday night and then yesterday with undefeated South Carolina and Iowa. I know one thing coming out of business, Becky, you need three things in sports, household names, rivalries, and games of consequence, and March Madness had all of that. Yeah, and I guess if you build it, uh, they will come. I mean, this is a situation where viewership, even before this last year for the WNBA, I think was up 23%. Um, your attendance was up as well. What do you anticipate? Is this a, a straight shot up or are there going to be hurdles along the way? Right. There's uh, well, certainly the 15 million that watched Friday night, which was amazing. Um, you know, that was a huge game of consequence. The final four. We did have our most watched regular season in 21 years last year. Our playoffs were great. We have super teams. We have these rivalries. And um, so, again, we'll have a 40 game regular season starting in May. But, you know, Caitlin brings with her a huge fan base. So does Angel, Cameron Brink from Stanford, Rakia Jackson from Tennessee. So just all these, Camilo Cardoso, who was the most outstanding player yesterday in the finals, all these players, again, coming in with big viewership and followership. So we're hoping that we'll capitalize on that in the WNBA. Commissioner, let's talk about media rights. Uh, you just extended the Prime Video deal uh, with Amazon. That's a two-year extension. 2025, I believe, becomes a big year for you in terms of how much money you can actually capitalize on all of this with, with all of the networks. Is that, is that when this is going to happen? And what kind of percentage change do you think uh, you'll be able to uh, extract, if you will? Well, we hope to at least double our rights fees. Uh, the one thing coming in, women's sports rights fees have been undervalued for too long. So we have this enormous opportunity at a time when, as you know, Andrew, the media landscape is changing so much. So yes, we have Prime Video, but again, uh, we have ESPN, we have CBS. We did an over the air deal with Scripps Ion last year for Friday night appointment viewing. So it's gonna be a hybrid no matter what, but we're really excited to get out in the marketplace. And how how, how much, how important is that money? You talk to some owners, they say, look, we gotta get our play. Look, right now the players uh, during the regular season, for example, uh, fly on commercial planes. Uh, they would love to be able to charter planes. They say they can't afford uh, to charter planes because the, the amount of money just doesn't make sense. Uh, the amount of money that the, the players are, are getting paid uh, doesn't make sense. Will that all change? Is that When you look at 2025, is that like a seminal moment that's going to change the entire game? I do. I think we're setting this league up, not just for the next three to five years with this next media rights deal, but for the next 30. And it is, if you look at the history of men's sports, do we have our bird magic moment like the NBA had when they were on tape delay and weren't flying quite like they're flying today. So it is media rights that funds a lot of what happens in men's sports, uh, as well as corporate partnerships. We've been doing great in the corporate partnership, doubled our corporate partnership revenue over the last three years. But again, this is a long-term uh, sustainable economic model we're trying to build to fund things like charter and higher player pay, and we're well on our way. I mean, if you look at just how much you can pay your players right now, 300000 versus the 5 or $10 million, you've got Caitlin Clark being offered to play in the three-on-three -three series. I mean, that's a crazy disparity. You keep them and hope that that publicity gets to the point where you can pay them some pretty big salaries too? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of opportunities beyond the base pay that gets quoted around league marketing deals, team marketing deals, and obviously the NIL in college, which most of the co women college basketball players are, have national brands, will carry over. And in fact, Caitlin's already signed as well as some other players additional deals to come into the pros because now you have a global platform, not just a local or national platform. So I feel confident, um, particularly for the stars, they will make a lot of money in the WNBA with their pro careers. Well, we love the storylines. Commissioner, I want to thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you so much, Becky. Cheese will be next. Coming up, it's Eclipse Day. If you're one of the millions who traveled to a viewing spot in the path of totality, you're in good company. Astronaut Mike Massimino is in Arkansas with NASA, and he's got some tips for your viewing safety. My advice is to enjoy the eclipse safely with the glasses and let the professionals film it. You're listening to Squawk Pod. Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to Squawk Box right here on CNBC. We are live from the NASDAQ market site in Times Square. I'm Becky Quick along with Andrew Ross Sorkin. Joe is out today. It's eclipse mania. It is peaking across the U.S. this afternoon. Solar eclipse has sky gazers flooding towns along the so-called path of totality. And companies jumping on the bandwagon with eclipse-themed goods. For more on all of this, I want to bring in former NASA astronaut, Mike Massimino, he is a Columbia University professor, senior advisor for the Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum. Mike joins us from Russellville, Arkansas, which is expected uh, to be the place for maximum viewing. I don't know if you can still get a flight uh, there in time right now, uh, but Mike, it is great to see you this morning. Pleasure. Uh, tell us, just, just do the news you can use for everybody who's thinking to themselves that they are going to uh, leave the office or go outside uh, mm -hmm. this afternoon. Uh, maybe if they're at school, they're going to leave school. Maybe if they're working from home, they're going to walk out of their house or look out the window. Mm -hmm. how, how you can do this safely and how you can't. Yeah. Well, Andrew, that's a good point. Is I, First of all, everyone should be looking up today at the right time. Find out where the eclipse is going to be taking place. Uh, even if it's not, you're not in the path of totality, it's still a really cool thing to see if it's even just partial. But you want to be looking up at the right time and you want to be really careful. You should never be looking into the sun without the correct eye protection. It's really important today. Uh, unless you're in the total path, in the path of total of totality, and only for those moments when it's in total, the total eclipse is taking place, is it safe to look up? But anytime there's any of the sun visible, you don't want to be looking up because you can damage your eyes. You don't want to be looking up without the right protection. So get the right kind of glasses to view the eclipse or use a pinhole camera. Don't okay. damage your eyes. It, Becky it can Quick has, has got the right glasses, it appears. Yeah. She's she's no, brought them with her no, nonetheless. You can't see anything in these things unless you're actually looking So at the, the question, That's though, right. is if you can't get access to these glasses, because, by the way, Hard to get at this point. I, I, you know, they've sold out in, in many places. If you go on Amazon, by the way, they'll deliver them to you on Thursday of this week, which is obviously not helpful. Uh, I think Warby Parker is still giving out some of them for free. Um, what do you recommend folks do? Uh, you can make a pinhole camera. When I was a kid, they, a long time ago, we were encouraged to make these pinhole cameras. You can find directions online, basically taking a piece of cardboard, putting a, a, getting a pinhole in it, and projecting it onto something else, and you'll be able to watch it that way. That's another safe way to view it. But if you can get your get your hands on the right eye protection, those those correct glasses, a good pair of those, uh, that's that's even better. And how but, uh, long? But if you can't, it, the pinhole cameras are back. Okay, so how long is this path uh, of totality last when you actually do see it? Uh, what should mm -hmm. people be looking for? What should they not be looking for? And by the way, what about in there are parts of the country that are going to have experience it, but they aren't going to see it because the weather is no good. Yeah, all those are true statements um, that you made with the weather in particular. But as far as the here, like in Russellville, we're going to have over four minutes of totality. And before that, it's going to be about an hour of this of the moon moving into position to start blocking the sun, which taking chunks of it as it goes, which is really cool. And then after those over four minutes of totality of darkness, it's going to start moving in the other, you know, it's going to keep moving in its path and you'll start exposing some of the sun. Again, you want to be having the right eye protection to see this. If you're not on the path of totality, you'll just see it, uh, the, the moon kind of move and, and go and, and block part of the sun and then recede again. But it's still something that's 
really cool to watch. But you do need the good weather. So hopefully right. wherever you are, you'll have a clear sky to get Mike, a good this view. Is a, this is a crucial point, And I should tell mm-hmm. you that uh, the Sorkin boys in my, my household have asked me to ask you this question. Um, and I think there's a safety issue involved. They all mm-hmm. want to uh, film it on their phones. Yeah. And so the question is, how can you do that and do that safely and be able to actually see what's going on on the screen of your phone to the extent you're going to try to film it and think you're uh, you know, a videographer or a uh, film director uh, and yeah. wear the glasses at the same time? Uh, give us some instructions for those. Uh, I know you're now an influencer yourself online. So here we go. Yeah. My, uh, Andrew, for, for your boys, for everybody, I, I, my advice is to enjoy the eclipse safely with the glasses and let the professionals film it. That's just that's just my advice. If you do want to film it, though, I would get the right filters. There are filters that you can buy that uh, or somehow get out again. It's too maybe it's too late to get those. But uh, you need the right filters in order to do that safely. Because it will break the, the break the camera. It'll break the the lens. I don't know what it would do to the camera. I, I don't know how harmful it would be. That I don't know. But I do know that they are selling uh, that you could get filters to, so that you could use them with your camera or your phone to uh, to get a good image. I don't know if you could. I've also heard that you could also just hold up the lenses to the camera lens to the uh, to your to right. your phone lens, and that might work. Um, That may be worth a try, but I'd be careful about that. My my opinion with these things is that you want to experience it. It was kind of like people would go see a space shuttle launch or a space launch and want to film it. I think that's great, but there's going to be a lot of really great images and filming of this stuff. I think what you want to do if you want to film something, I would film the reactions of your friends. Again, I'm you know I'm not a filmmaker, but the reactions of the people around you, what they think, what they're doing, I think that's the (laughs) exciting and unique thing that you can you can film. That's 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 my advice. Okay, uh, Mike, thank you for, uh, we'll call it a PSA. Becky was doing a PSA with the glasses. She's now taking them off because I think she can't re- read from here. He's right, though. It's the film and the reactions of people around right. him. My brother was at the last one. They all traveled to go see this lunar eclipse. It was cloudy and they couldn't see it. So Rob put on a show for everybody who was watching. And that is the fun part of it, doing this. That's the podcast for today. Thank you for listening. Squawk Box is hosted by Joe Kernan, Becky Quick, and Andrew Ross Sorkin weekday mornings on CNBC at 6 a.m. Eastern. To get the smartest takes from our TV show right into your ears, follow Squawk Pod wherever you're listening now. We'll meet you back here tomorrow and happy viewing. We are clear. Thanks, guys.